Hello. The purpose of this training is to help you get through the verification process of the food service applications. My name is David Hartley and I'll be presenting this webinar today. And there are my contact information, my phone number, and my email address. You can call with questions if I'm out of the office. You can ask any, any of the reviewer questions about this and they can help you. So there's two processes with the applications. One is the approval process. You get the applications, you accept them, and you approve them based on face value. Then the verification process is where you're verifying what they put on that application, which gave them either the free or reduced price benefit. Any denied applications are not subject to the verification process. All right, so as I said, first, you're gonna, we're gonna talk about the verification process. Hopefully this will help make it easier. This session is conducted, the verification process, we're hoping will help you complete this process easier. The process will either help you keep individuals and sometimes it helps you increase the number of free and reduced price eligible students. Families may not cooperate because one, they no longer qualify. Families may have filled out the application in September. You're, fill, you're doing the verification process in October, November. They've gotten a pay raise, they've gotten a better job, they're making more money and they may no longer qualify, so they may not respond. Hopefully they'll at least respond and say, I don't qualify anymore. Their level of education might create a barrier. <clears throat> if that's the case, hopefully you can reach out and help them complete this process. Language issues, that's becoming a problem in certain parts of the state. We have immigrants coming in and sometimes they need help completing these processes. They might need help approving the, submitting the application, and they might need help with the verification process as well. Some cases, the local school is, school is able to help families directly with the verification process. You can reach out and ask if they would like some help. <clears throat> Who is not required to complete the verification process? Schools that are participating in special provisions, either CEP, Community Eligibility Provision, or if they're in Special Provision 2 and not in the base year. Remember, Special Provision 2 with the base year, they do collect applications. Anytime that you are collecting applications, you will complete the verification process. Schools in a milk only program, students, younger kids, pre-K, Head Start, might only be in school to get special milk. They might not be in school for breakfast or lunch, so they're eligible for a special milk program. In that case, the verification process is not completed. Residential child care institutes that do not have day students. Residential Child Care Institute with overnight students, they're wards of the state, they're automatically free. If they have day students, then those students have submitted applications and the verification process is required to be completed. Even if your district is not required to complete the entire verification process, there's a section three on the report that's gonna ask questions about the directly certified students for the current school year. That part of the verification form will need to be completed. What is a school district? A school district is related to the number of school boards in the district. So an RSU or an MSAD has one school board. RSU1 MSAD is a group of towns creating one school district. So RSU10, RSU11, Gardner has, has kids from West Gardner, South Gardner, Randolph, 
Pittston, they're all RSU 11, and they have one school board. An AOS, alternated, alternated Operating System, or a union, each of the schools within that AOS or union has its own school board. Therefore, they are their own district. <clears throat> there are possibly four types of verification that you can complete. There's the standard or error prone, and that's the required, that's the first option for you to complete the verification process is what's called error prone, and we'll get into that definition. For the standard, you're gonna verify 3% of all of the applications that have been approved. It could be an income application, it could be a categorical application that's been approved because there's a food stamp number on it. But make sure that you combine applications from the one family. If you have multiple applications from one family, only count it one time. This is error prone. Error prone is specific and we're gonna explain that in the next screen or two. But 3% of all of the approved applications focusing on the error prone applications. Alternate one is what's called random. That's 3% of all of the approved application. It doesn't matter how it was approved. If that application is giving that child the eligibility, then it's subject to random verification. <coughs> Alternate two are focused 1% of the approved income applications and a half a percent of the approved food stamp applications. If you have a large number of applications, alternate two might help you have to verify fewer applications. But if you only have 30, 50 applications, this really isn't gonna help you. All right, what is an error prone application? It is an income approved application that the monthly income shown is within $100 of the monthly income or it's within $1,200 of the annual income. If either one of these are met, that application is considered error prone. If you wish to complete an alternate method of verification, Permission must be requested from me, David Hartley. So you'll have to email me, tell me what you want to do, and I'll answer your email. Don't call me, I won't give you an answer. So this just shows an example of what, an, what meets the error prone process. So you'll see that for the free income guidelines, for monthly family of three, it's $2,694 or below. For a family of three annually, it's $32,318. So you'll notice above that, there's a figure, 2,594 monthly. So that's a $100 difference. That application, income approved between those two figures is error prone. If it's yearly income, You'll notice the difference, 31,118, that's a $1,200 difference. So if the income is built between those, it's error prone. And then in the third line, you'll see that I've added $100 to the 2,694, and I've added 1,200 to the 32,318. So even if it's a reduced, it can still be error prone using figures above the free income guidelines. And then also on the last line, I've got the reduced guideline for a family of three. Monthly, 3833. Annually, 45,991. And above that on line four is the, the space that will show you what would be an error prone income approved application. 
So for instance, an error prone application, the family size is three. The income is $2,701. Is this an error prone application? Yes, because you'll notice that it is between the 2,694, which is the guideline for a family of three, and 2,794, which is $100 above that guideline figure. Since it meets between those two, it's a reduced approved application, and it is an error prone application. We have a family of three. Their weekly income is $891. Is this an error-prone application? First of all, you have to convert this to annually to see if it is, because there's no guideline for weekly error-prone guidance. So we take the $652, multiply that by 52, and come up with $46,332 annual income. It's not an error prone application, it's actually a denied application. And as I mentioned, we're only doing approved free and reduced applications. The difference may only be $341, but because it was denied, it's not part of the sample pool, it's not considered error prone. Here, this next one, we have two income guidelines, so once again, we're going to have to convert it to annually. Family of three. Every two weeks, multiplied by 26. Every two, twice a month, multiplied by 24. That gives us a yearly income, adding those two figures, of $44,800. So... 44,800, yep, it's reduced application, and it is less than $1,200 below the reduced income guideline for a family of three. CNP Web can help you to figure out what's an error prone or how many applications you have to verify. So when you log into CNP Web, You'll see here that we've got the Forms tab. And then on the Forms tab, we've got the button over here, the plus sign, by the Verification Summary. So you're going to hit that plus sign. It's going to ask you for the number of error-prone applications. If you don't have any, put zero. But fill that in. Leave it blank. You're going to get an error message. Next, it's going to ask you how many categorical applications have been approved. What that means is it's an application, the family put a food stamp number on it, and you approved it based on the food stamp number on that application. Anytime that you receive an application from a family and they're on the direct cert list, you're not going to count that application because the application is not giving them the benefit. The direct cert list is giving them that benefit. So a food stamp number on the application and you approve that application to give the family the benefit, that's going to go on this line. Then below here, you'll see this is income eligible, the reduced number of students, number of applications, income approved, number of students, number of applications, and then it's going to total it up below. Before you to get the results, you're going to below what the screen we saw, line six, you're going to check the certification box. That says yes, the information that I submitted is what I have. Then you're going to hit the Save button. After you've hit the Save button, you're going to go back to the Forms tab. You're going to check on Verification Results. And you'll have, it doesn't show it on this screen because this one's done, 
But after you've completed the initial verification summary, your verification results will show you right here the plus sign. You click on that plus sign, and it's going to show you this information. So for this application, for this district, it shows that you have to verify three applications. Sample size, as I mentioned, only count approved applications. Only count one application per family. As I mentioned, do not count applications for families that are also on the direct certification list. That DC list is what is giving that family the benefit and is not subject to the verification process. A categorically approved application is subject and can be in the sample of the verification process. Select the samples, error prone, 3% of all of the pre free and approved applications, one per family. If you have enough error prone applications, you're gonna first select from those. If you do not have enough error prone applications, or you don't have any, then you're gonna randomly select from all of the applications. You're not gonna focus on those that are close to error prone. It's either completely random or it's error prone, error prone being the first method. One of the things you have to understand with the verification process, when you're doing the 3%, you always round up. For instance, you have 135 approved applications. 135 times 3% is 4.05. Since you always round up, and the computer, when you're using CNP Web, will round it up, will show you that you have to do five. Always round up, never, never, ever, ever round down. We're not following standard rounding procedures in this process. If you have 10 error prone applications, you have to do five. You randomly select from those five. You can't, you can't select Betty Smith because you, she cut you off in traffic the other day and you're still mad about it. Randomly select from the 10 approved error prone applications. If you have to do five, but you only have four error prone applications, those four are automatic. They're part of the sample. The last one, the number five, will come from randomly selecting from the rest of the approved applications. It could be an income, it could be a categorical, it doesn't matter. But that will be the fifth application randomly, randomly selected if you don't have enough error prone. Any time that you're doing the verification process, a confirming official, someone else other than the approving official, must confirm the status that you made. You may have to explain to them what you did and how you do it to help them figure it out, but a confirming official is required when you're manually completing the verification process. That confirming official, when they do this, will sign that application agreeing with, sign and date that application, agreeing with the status that you've made. So here's an example. For the child nutrition application process, there's actually three people that could potentially be involved. The approving official and the verification official, it can be the same person. So in this case, that's Barney Rubble. He's the approving official and he's the verification official. The confirming official has to be somebody different. The confirming official in this case is Susie Smith. Then you have a third different person, and that's the, what's called the hearing official. And the hearing official is who will review the whole process if the family objects to the determination that was made. 
the hearing official won't be involved in this at all unless the family doesn't accept the eligibility that they have received. So potentially three different people are involved in this. In the verification process, there are two different people, that verification official and the confirming official must be two different people. That is not required if you're using an electronic approval system, because that's not going to make an error. However, it's not a bad idea to have someone else look at them. If you're entering the data into a program, for instance, NutriKids, maybe you mistyped something. Someone else may look at that and catch an error from your typing. The online applications that the families fill out, they're filled it out. Hopefully they don't put things wrong and it's approved. So if you're doing, if you have an electronic approval system, confirming official is not required. However, not a bad idea. Can a district use an alternate method of verification? Yes. If your non-response rate is less than 20% in the previous school year, and you wish to use an alternate method, the district must receive state approval from the state agency. Once again, I'm the person that you're gonna request that from. Only send that in an email. I won't answer that question over the phone. What the non-response rate means is that last year, 20% of the subjects did not respond to the verification process. Alternate methods, as mentioned earlier, you've got alternate one, which is random 3% from all of the applications. Alternate two, 1% 1 of the income approved, selecting from error prone still, and a half a percent of the categorically approved applications. So say you're doing alternate one, you have to ver you have 145 applications, 3% gives you 4.35, that's five. One way to select the applications, 145 divided by the five that you have to do is 29. So maybe you'll count every 29th application to determine which applications you're gonna verify. Because the alternate is from all of them. It could, doesn't matter how it was approved. Alternate one is from the entire staff. Alternate two, once again, it depends on how many applications you have, whether or not this will work for you. If you have 30 approved applications, you're only gonna verify one. And if you request alternate two, that means you must do two applications, one food stamp, what income? All right, so you're ready to start. You know how many applications you have to verify. So you're gonna contact the parents for documentation. On the Child Nutrition webpage of sample letters that you can use to send out to request the data. You're gonna send them the household notification letter and you're going to keep a copy of the notice sent to that family, not the master letter. When we come to do the review, we want to see every notifi verification notification letter sent out to each individual family. You sent one to the Hartley family, I want to see that letter addressed to them. You sent another one to the Beasley family, I want to see that letter addressed to that family. You got to include the full Privacy Act statement, both the federal and the state. In the notification letter, give them a certain time frame to respond to you. We suggest 10 calendar days. And whatever time frame you use, stick to it. Even if they say, oh, I forgot, I'll have that to you tomorrow. If tomorrow's past that, that, that deadline you gave them, move on to step two which we'll get into step two in just a minute. 
record keeping, as I make and keep copies of all correspondence between the families and you. You send them something, save a copy of it. They send you something, keep that. Keep notes of any phone conversations. You called because you needed clarification. Keep a note on the document, whatever, someplace that says, I called the family on this date and I asked them about this and told them I need to hear back in two or three days. Not just the copy of the master as I stated, but the actual letter addressed to the family. Every family selected for the verification process must receive a final letter closing the process. You can't just call them and say, okay, I'm done. They have to get a letter. Notification must include a no cost telephone number if they wanna call you with questions. They might call the school their kids attend. The secretary there may call you with the question and the phone number and you call them back. Typically nowadays with cell phones, this is not an issue. However, keep it in mind, they have to be able to call you at no cost to them. Verification, notification, and tracking form. So as I mentioned, we have on the Child Nutrition webpage a sample letter, sample saying, congratulations, you've been selected. Information to include that says what they have to send to you. And closing letters telling that this is over, thank you, we're done. And as mentioned, I told you, laws and rules, you have to keep the civil rights statements on these notifications that go out starting this process. Those civil rights statements are on our webpage, both the federal and the state. So make sure you're using the most current and up-to-date, which we have posted on our webpage. This is just a copy of the household notification letter. You've been selected. I need information. I need to hear back from you from this date, this time. Here's a phone number that you can call me at. There's just, and then here's a copy. This is still there as well. This is what they can send you to prove what they put on that application. They're going to send a pay stub, something about child support payments that they receive. No income. If they have no income, they have to briefly explain how they're getting by. How are they living? How are they feeding? What are they doing? Certain types of military housing are income. Certain types are not. Federal non-discrimination statement. State non-discrimination statement. Both of them on the Child Nutrition webpage. All right, you've got the information back. Review it. Make a determination if all information needed is present. Do you need more information? If you need more information, you request it from the parents. You can call them. But as I mentioned earlier, tell them what you need and give them a time frame. Give them a couple of days from the phone call. You call them on November 1st. I need to know what the pay periods are because I can't figure them out. Please call me by November 3rd. November 4th, you're going to take the next step. That next step is you have to make an additional attempt. So you call them. I, I need more information. If I don't have it by November 3rd, then, then we're going to have to end this process. If you haven't heard from the family, you must make a second attempt. That second attempt can also be a phone call. Keep notes. I called November 1st. I haven't heard from them. I need this information by November 3rd. November 4th, you haven't heard from them. The process is over. Send them a final closing letter. They're no longer free. They're now paid status. Stick with the time frames you give them. I was in a school several years ago that verification, they kept saying, I'll have it tomorrow, I'll have it tomorrow. Tomorrow is now two months later. It shouldn't go that far. Whatever time frames you give them, stick with it.
determine the pay period. Sometimes this is not the easiest thing to do when you're, when you're reviewing the documentation. Look at the pay stubs. Look for, see if it tells you, is it every two weeks? Is it, what, is it twice a month? Whatever it is. If you can't figure out what the pay periods are, call. Document the phone call as I stated. Be sure to review the submitted documentation and determine the correct pay period. Reviews have shown that this is not being done correctly. Don't hesitate to ask the family clarifying data. No response, they do not respond. You have to make at least one additional attempt. As I mentioned, it can be a phone call, give them a deadline, follow the timeline given. Evaluate the information. Do they give you a food stamp number? If they gave you a food stamp number, check the direct certification list. They're on the direct certification list now, you're done. You can do an individual search on the direct certification list. Check the income for monthly or yearly, whatever they do. If they're self-employed, they're going to have to send you Schedule C. And from Schedule C, you're going to use line 29. If they're farming income, they're going to send you Schedule F. And on Schedule F, you're going to use line 34. Now, here's an example for self-employed. They send you their information. Self-employed line C shows 14, a negative $14,250. For the verification process, for application process, a negative line C income becomes negative. Their spousal income on the tax return has $34,250. So for the taxes, their total income is $20,000. However, for the verification process, negative becomes a zero. Spousal income annually is $34,250. That is their annual income, $34,250. Forms, as mentioned on our webpage, letters to the parents, request more information, We've checked your application, you're closing it. They may call you or email you and say, I don't qualify anymore. They call you, ask them nicely to send you a letter, but at least take notes of that phone call. I heard from the Hartley family on November 15th, they no longer qualify. Still send them a closing letter. They get that closing letter, they have self-denied, they don't respond. You're done. I never called you. Then send me a letter. Notify the family of the decision. If the category changed, the family must be given the opportunity to appeal that process. And that is where the hearing official comes in. If they appeal the decision that was made, then the hearing official is going to get involved. The change becomes effective in 10, 10 calendar days if benefit is lost. If benefit is gained, make it immediate. That helps everybody. A sample of the letter that is on our webpage. Now make sure that on this form for public schools, maybe they changed from free to reduced. Reduced would have a cost normally, but in the state of Maine, because of Maine law, students don't pay for meals. So make sure you're not putting on here for public schools a 40 cent reduced cost for a, a reduced meal. You don't even put on here a paid cost. They're going from free to paid. It's still a no cost meal to the family. So don't put how much they're going to pay because the family is not going to pay for meals in Maine for the school nutrition program. What is income? Before any deductions such as income taxes, social security taxes, insurance benefits, charitable contributions, bonds, if they're making, if they're a salaried employee and they make a thousand dollars a week, 
that's their income, that $1,000. If they're hourly and they make $20 an hour and they work 40 hours a week, that's $800 a week, that's their income. If they have a source where they're receiving cash on a regular basis, they're receiving money, they have something set up, they have a trust fund, they're getting $2,000 a month, that's income. In-kind benefits are not cash payments, therefore not income. I painted your house, you fixed my car, we didn't trade cash, it's not income. Common question, seasonal employment. Might need a tax return, because that's going to show you the yearly income. Seasonal employment might be just summer employment. They're not working during the winter months. They filled out the application in September. You Doing the verification in November, they're no longer employed. Ask for a tax return. Temporary layoff. The, the factory is closing for a month to do a major cleaning. They need to do some repairs. So what were you making before the layoff? Child support payments received are counted as income. Child support payments made do not reduce the income. Child support payments received, yes, income. Child support payments paid, no, does not reduce income. As mentioned pre previously, self-employment, Schedule C, line 29, Schedule F, line 34, remembering that if either one of those lines is a negative, for our purposes, it becomes a zero. There are certain federal programs, different types of military housing, that may or may not be considered income for our program. Excluded federal programs, these don't count as income. The VISTA program, RSVP, foster grandparents, and other domestic volunteer service acts, those are not income. SCORE and ACE job training partnership, land trust payments to certain Indian tribes. There's a manual called the Eligibility Manual for School Meals. There's a link to it on our webpage. It's an excellent reference tool. And it's also help you with approving the applications. Bookmark it, print it off, have it handy, use it. It's an excellent reference tool. As mentioned earlier, keep all records for three years of the original letter. You have to keep it for three years plus the current. You're basically keeping it for four years. Document everything. I called, I received, or whatever you got. They sent you an email, print it off, put it with the file, save it. Records are confidential, just like the application. It's not shared data. Do not send DOE Food Service Office any information unless we request it. Because whatever you send to us, we have to keep. We don't want to keep it. Don't send it to it. Don't send it to us unless we request it. So we have, as I mentioned, eligibility guidance. It's on our webpage under the uh, application approval tab. It's an old manual, but it's still effective. It's still valid. The information has not changed. You can call the office. You call Paula, she'll direct you to the best person that's available. Since I'm in the office every time, typically she sends the call to me. If I'm not, she'll figure out somebody else. You call me, you email me with questions. I'm traveling, I'm working out, out of the office that day. When I get back, I'll respond as soon as I can. Form must be completed in online in CNP web by November 20th. And that's the only method. Don't print off the report and send it to me. I'll send it back to you and tell you it's not done. Only complete it in CNP web. Needs to be completed by November 20th. So as you'll see here, we've got the verification summary forms on the sponsor summary forms, verification summary right here. The plus sign starts the process. 
As mentioned earlier, you're going to fill out, I have so many error prone applications. Should have looked at this better, the math doesn't work. I have two categorical, I have four income eligible reduced, and I have five income eligible free. Then here, so here we do have the plus sign. You've completed the verification summary. Now you're going to go to the verification results, click on the plus sign. And this will tell you how many applications you have to verify. So you've been going through the process. I've completed it for two families. I've filled it out. Now, when you go in to fill this out, there's going to be drop downs. What was their original benefit type? Why did it, what happened? Why did it change? Did it go from free? Did they not respond? Did they respond? It changed to this. But you'll also see in this case, this district, they had to complete three verification, they had to verify three applications. It says they did two, and it shows two. And it shows there's one remaining. So this verification process for this district is going to stay open until it's been completed. You verified them all, requested one. I've done it, I've entered it. You're gonna check this tab over here, check here when the verification has been entered. And then you're gonna to check to certify the results. Once you did that, you'll see this. Verification summary, complete. Verification results, complete. You're done with this for this school year. A lot of time, the auditors are asking for the results of your verification process. So if you want to do show them that, use the verification results screen and look for the eye. You click on the eye and it will show you that other screen that shows you each family and what happened. And that you can, ver you can give to the auditors to show you what happened, show you, show them what was reported to the state in the verification process. You have questions, send me an email, call me, ask other reviewers, they can answer the questions. If they're not sure, they'll contact me. Student eligibility page, this is where you can get the information that I mentioned, student eligibility webpage, verification tab, and then the resources tab. The eligibility manual I told you about, the sample letters I told you about. There's even a form you can use to help track the process to keep you on track to complete it in a good time frame. All right, verification, to, prov to provide a consistent plan for handling missing or late verification reports. This is the verification procedure for missing and late verification reports that the office has. November 5th or within two days, a reminder notice will be sent out about the verification process. Then on November 20th or within two days, a list of the school administrative units missing verification reports submitted to the team leader or the designee and post it on our webpage. And that means complete, it's done. If it's not complete, notices will go out. You've started it, you haven't completed it, you haven't submitted it, you haven't verified it, you're gonna get a notice. December 1st, or within two days, the Child Nutrition Service staff will send reminder letters to the superintendents of the school administrative units about the verification process. Once again, it hasn't been started, it's in process, it has not been completed, this notification will go out. December 10th, a second notice is gonna go out to the superintendents. It'll also be emailed to the verification official that we're not gonna have it and very soon IDs will be revoked to file claims to order USDA foods. November 15th, IDs are revoked, passwords are revoked. 
you can't file a claim, you can't order USDA foods. When the SAU verification report is received and correct, the Child Nutrition Office staff will reinstate passwords and permissions within three days. If a SAU, School Administrative Unit, is unable to meet the federal requirement guideline, the superintendent must contact the Department of Education Child Nutrition Service Office via email, preferably email. The email is going to come to David Hartley at this office requesting a waiver for an extension. That request for an extension must include the reason why was it not why was it not completed by November 20th? Estimated completion date and the actions that will be taken so that it will not be late in the future. Any waiver that's been requested that is passed December 15th must go to the New England Regional Office Food Nutrition Service for approval. Once, even if the, even after, even when the waiver has been submitted, the request for an extension, keep doing the process. Don't wait for the response that says you have a waiver. Continue moving. Continue with the process. Meet the timeline that you're requesting. You're going to meet it in. Don't wait for the approval. Depending on if it has to go to Nero, it could take a couple of days. It might take a week. Typically, I'm going to approve it that day. So don't wait, continue the process. 10 days after the extension request that expires or within two days, child nutrition staff will revoke the SAU's permissions to do claims and order USDA foods. So you request an extension for December 10th. I don't have your report on December 20th. Your IDs will be revoked until we get the report. All right, that's pretty much the, the webinar for today. Don't forget, if you have questions, don't hesitate to email to call with questions. We would rather you call with questions to get answers to complete this process better than delay this process for a long time. As soon as you have a question, ask the question. Thank you. Good luck. Have a good day.